Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. The street is a war zone. How are they going to get down here? You know, uh, even Uber, you know, the detours are a mess. So I'm not as hopeful as I have been in previous years. Business owners along St. Mary's preparing for the worst ahead of what's historically a major night for bars. Now, one owner says that those businesses desperately need customers, but construction that's nearly a year from completion is what's driving them away. Yeah, the night team's John Paul Barajas about the struggles along the St. Mary's Strip and how the city may have to step in and help. The drilling by crews at a construction site are drowning out the beats of nightlife on the St. Mary's Strip. Videos of crowded bars, now just a distant memory. We saw a $67 sales revenue for a day on a weekend day. Down the street at Rumble had an $11 Wednesday. Not even during COVID when I was forcibly closed and I was doing drive through service only, I was able to sustain more employees than I'm currently able to sustain. Aaron Pena, owner of the Squeeze Box, explains people can't navigate the street. He says road closures, detours, and the mess that is the St. Mary's Strip is driving customers away, businesses to a breaking point, and staff to look for other work. I started here working, making a certain amount of money and it dropped down by more than 60%. I'm thinking that a lot of bars, including myself and restaurants, you know, any nightlife hospitality that's on this street will not make it past this next year. If you do manage to find a parking spot and enjoy a drink at one of the businesses, navigating the strip by foot is just as complicated. Much of the street doesn't have any sidewalks and you're walking on gravel or dirt. There's also safety concerns that patrons could step right into the construction site where there's large equipment like bulldozers as well as pits and other hazards like nails and walking over boards and people can get hurt and they don't they don't care. District one councilman Mario Bravo says the city does care, telling us officials are looking into financial assistance for businesses impacted. I had a conversation with the city manager and the mayor about that yesterday and they're exploring solutions right now and I hope to hear back from them in the next week or two. Mayor Ron Nirenberg telling KSAT the process is being expedited. We are putting the pressure on the contractor to get this job done. They've been through COVID. They've been through, you know, policy rankling. They've been through a lot of things that have been uh, challenging. The mayor and councilmen are hopeful the construction project here can be completed by March of 2023. The owner of Squeezebox said that the financial assistance that was brought up needs to come sooner rather than later if the businesses here are going to survive. As for tomorrow night, they are still optimistic that large crowds will be back on the strip. They just hope that everyone's careful and nobody gets injured with its current conditions. On the St. Mary Strip, John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. A 17 year old spending his first night back at home and we're telling you that because it's a big deal because seven weeks ago this teen was almost killed by a San Antonio police officer in the parking lot of McDonald's. So we want to show you Eric Cantu. There he is. His mother, Victoria Caceres, shared this picture with us. The 17 year old has been in the hospital recovering from injuries to his stomach, diaphragm, lungs, liver, bicep and forearm. And at one point he was even placed on life support. But now he's on the road to recovery. As for the former SAPD officer charged in the shooting, James Brennan, his court hearing originally scheduled for tomorrow has now been moved and a new hearing date could come by next week. Brennan is now charged with two counts of aggravated assault by a public servant. It's their final resting place. Uvalde City Council discussing a change to an ordinance to allow upright headstones for the Robb Elementary School victims. The motion tabled tonight, but not because they don't want to improve, want to approve it. Council members realize they need to change the language of the ordinance and include additional fees. The Robb victims families have been pushing for 24 inches on a six inch plot. Now the Uvalde public also wants the same thing. Once they figure out the cost for maintenance and extra fees, the council is expected to approve the ordinance. Leaving an abusive situation we know is never easy, especially when you don't have a safe place to go. The night team's Lee Waldman spoke with a woman who's in that very position thanks to an affordable housing shortage in San Antonio. We've been married almost 13 years, a little over 13 years. It started when my son was born, which was two years into our relationship. Over a decade of abuse, now she's saying no more. We're hiding this woman's identity to protect her from her abuser. You go from being a strong woman, which I was, and it, it takes 
everything that you have, all your strength. Four years ago, she got on the Opportunity Home wait list to receive a housing voucher to leave and find a safe place for herself and her son. She got the voucher last month. And I've been looking for a month. I, I've, I've been calling and calling and calling, but there's a waiting list right now. Valerie Ochoa works with Opportunity Home. She says that wait list is happening because they don't have enough landlords willing to accept the affordable housing vouchers. It has a huge impact to the community. Um, there's thousands of people on the waiting list that can't find affordable living right now. Opportunity Home recently held a landlord summit with the goal of educating and attracting landlords to its voucher program. 119 attended. I do feel like that education only helps put the word out and helps landlords to understand the benefit of putting their unit on the program. For now, this woman is living back with her abuser after he tracked her down when she was staying with friends and family. She just got an extension on her voucher. She hopes space will open soon. I don't want to wait any longer. We need, we need peace. I need peace. And that was our Lee Waldman reporting. We certainly hope that that woman finds a safe place to stay. Now, Opportunity Home's effort to streamline its voucher program is going to continue into the new year. And its staff is planning to create a list of participating landlords to make that process more efficient. And by the way, if you or someone you know is in a dangerous situation, we invite you to our website, ksad.com, because that's where we have a link to help victims of domestic violence. Caught. A man on Texas's most wanted fugitives list with a long criminal history that includes child abuse and robbery now in jail. The U.S. Marshals Law Lone Star Fugitive Task Force arrested 40-year-old Daniel M Munoz last Thursday. Munoz was wanted in Bear County on two warrants for failure to comply with sex offender registration requirements. Munoz received a 10-year prison sentence back in 2000 for robbery and two more 10-year prison sentences related to sexual assault of a 14-year-old child. Now for a look at some of today's big headlines in your Nightbeat News Flash. Lots of Thanksgiving prep work happening in Uvalde this evening for the annual Love Ya you, love you, Uvalde event. It's been a tradition for 39 years, but this year is special. It's being held in honor of Rob Elementary victim Jackie Casadas. Her aunt Leticia Hernandez has been running the Thanksgiving lunch for the past 12 years, making more than a thousand meals for families in their community to enjoy together. This year, in light of the six month anniversary of the Rob Elementary shooting, they considered not having it. But thinking of Jackie, who was born into this tradition, they needed they knew they needed to do more in her memory. She was ready. She she enjoyed it. She loved it. Like she was always excited and bubbly. It's not going to be the same without her. It was definitely very difficult, um, but because we're doing it for her and she would have been really mad if we did it. <laughs> um, that's why we're doing it, doing this for Jackie. I'm glad they're doing it for Jackie. The doors will open at 10 a.m. at the Fairplex. Food will be served starting at 11 a.m. For many, tomorrow will be a traveling day for the Thanksgiving holiday, and if you're hitting the road, you might want to get your full tank here first. The average price of gas, $2.88, according to AAA. That's 75 cents cheaper than the national average. Part of what's driving the drop, oil prices, back to pre-Russian invasion levels. Price is still historically high, so it pays to maximize that dollar. Check your tires, get the junk out of your trunk, and once you hit the road, take it easy on the gas pedal. The freeze on federal student loan payments will continue into 2023. The U.S. Department of Education extending the pause through next summer. But I'm completely confident my plan is legal. But right now it's on hold because of these lawsuits. Yeah, right now the Biden administration's student loan relief program tied up in legal challenges. It would offer up to $20,000 in relief to eligible borrowers. At least 16 million Americans were approved for relief before applications were suspended earlier this month. If you have a federal student loan, here's what you need to know. The Department of Education says it cannot discharge debt or accept new applications under court order. President Biden says this latest extension will give the U.S. Supreme Court time to hear the case in its current term. Payments will resume 60 days after the program is implemented or this case is resolved. However, if nothing is changed by June 30th, payments will be reinstated 60 days later in late August. And that's 
a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. Coming up, Thanksgiving prep is underway, but maybe not to this extent. Why that kitchen needs 2,000 cooks to complete the feast. Plus, the topic of bar and club security now on everyone's mind after the mass shooting in Colorado. So we're going to discuss how local bars are keeping their places safe. And speaking of that mass shooting tonight, survivors reliving the horrific events where they say they escaped with courage. This is we get more information on where the shooter is now and his connections to San Antonio. It's next on the Night Beat. The suspect now behind bars after a mass shooting at an LGBTQ nightclub in Colorado Springs. This news comes as survivors start to come forward and share their experience about what happened that night. ABC's Morgan Norwood brings us their stories. Tonight, the suspect in the Colorado Springs nightclub massacre now behind bars. Police say Anderson Lee Aldrich was released from the hospital after sustaining what sources describe as significant injuries from a takedown inside of the club. Aldrich now set to go before a judge Wednesday on 10 preliminary charges, including five counts of murder and five hate crimes. Their public defender writing and recently released court filings that Aldrich is non-binary and uses they them pronouns. If this is in fact a hate crime, then it's important for us to signal to the world that we don't tolerate hate crimes in this community. It comes amid questions about the suspect's background and whether more could have been done to stop this attack. This doorbell camera footage showing Aldridge surrendering to police in 2021 after allegedly making a bomb threat against their mother. But Aldridge's family refused to press charges, and because of that, the case was dismissed and Aldridge's record sealed, so nothing showed up on the background check for the legal gun purchase. As the suspect prepares to go before a judge, we're hearing the harrowing moments when survivors came face to face with the alleged gunman, Ed Sanders, shot in the leg and back. It felt crunchy, like uh like a mini explosion. And Richard Fierro hailed a hero and thanked by President Biden after police say he charged the rifle wielding suspect and wrestled away the gun. I grabbed him by the back of his little cheap armor thing and I pulled him down. I grabbed the pistol from him and I, I just kept wailing on him. Morgan Norwood, ABC News, Colorado Springs. We are also learning more about the suspect and his connections to San Antonio. Northeast ISD officials confirming tonight the suspect was a freshman at Johnson High School. He withdrew from the district in October of 2015. This news comes after records show the suspect also changed his name in Bear County. The suspect did this before his 16th birthday. Records show he wanted to, quote, protect himself from a father with a criminal history. The records offered no details on what exactly that history is. Now, we spoke with bar and nightclub owners in San Antonio about how they're reassuring people at their establishments, and they're telling us that businesses are working together to create a safe space for everyone. For the businesses on St. Mary Strip, it's normal to have armed and even third-party security guards, but they say the attacks like the one that we just saw in Colorado are pretty hard to prevent because they're targeted. We have a zero tolerance policy for anyone that undertakes action where someone from that community feels threatened or unsafe or unwelcome. That's not who we are. We so what are we doing? Well, in light of the shooting, San Antonio police said earlier this week that they added patrols in the St. Mary's and Main Street entertainment districts during the overnight hours. All right, this week, every kitchen is going to be busy, and that's no different for the kitchen at the AT&T Stadium in Dallas. The chefs and staff there prepping for the Cowboys Thanksgiving Day game. Chef Heather Fuller and her 2,000 member culinary team cooking for more than 90,000 fans at the Giants and Cowboys game. Just like on the field, it's all teamwork. Not only is the number of kitchen staff impressive, but so is the amount of food. It includes cooking more than 4,700 pounds of cornbread for dressing, 11,700 pounds of turkey, and more than 10 pounds of mac and cheese. Mm. That sounds a little off. 10 pounds of mac and cheese? Sounds like it'd be more. I was lost at mac and cheese. That, <laughs> You're like, that ooh, took that's... Over, that, that took over any... Uh, yeah, good. exactly. All right, 50 degrees out there, and uh, I'm guessing all the drizzle out there maybe 
taking some of our focus away <laughs> yes. from live cam tonight? Yeah, and visibilities are down, and it's just drizzly and damp. Not the real soaking rain or the type of rain that really adds up to much. D just the nuisance dampness that causes wet roads, everything to be uh, wet and damp, and road spray and uh, intermittent windshield wipers. This will be the case all the way through the morning commute tomorrow. Damp again tomorrow. More of the same with some periodic sprinkles added in then scattered rain even if you thunderstorms possible on Thanksgiving that'll lead to a sunny and warmer weekend a good weekend to get outside and get those Christmas decorations and the Christmas lights up all right let's get right to it right now and I want to start off with tomorrow I mean right now we're near 50 degrees we're going to stay there the rest of the night we'll start the day tomorrow at 50 and then make it up to about 59 for the high temperature cloudy gray day again unseasonably cool and damp, especially in the morning, then periodic dampness the rest of the day. By the afternoon, some locations could make it in the low 60s, such as down near Stinson Airport, Poteet even about 60 degrees, Nixon area about 62, and same goes for Lavernia up through Seguin and New Braunfels, but most of us upper 50s. Let's talk about the big pattern and what's coming our way. Quiet across the state, just that low level cloud cover, nothing to show up on radar because it's all beneath the radar beam. This is just drizzle activity, nothing high up in the clouds that then falls through that radar beam. But what we're watching is this action here in the northwestern US. It's a dip in the upper level flow, along with another little ripple in the upper level flow near the bottom. Baja Peninsula. These are the Thanksgiving Day systems that will be coming together and converging over Texas and in turn increasing our rain chances and giving us what looks like a fairly damp Thanksgiving, especially at least the first half of the day. Here's our future cast. We'll go pretty slowly with this starting at 5 a.m. On Thursday, I think even in the pre dawn hours, we'll have the fog, the drizzle, a few sprinkles and then developing light showers. So wet roads and reduced visibility for early morning travel on Thanksgiving and really for the first half of the day, I think at least 9 a.m. scattered activity, uh, some of embedded heavier rain showers possible, uh, especially late morning into the early afternoon and then later on in the day, especially as we get towards sunset, that's when most of the action should start moving out of town and heading east of San Antonio. And actually a clearing line could get pretty close to town. It wouldn't surprise me if we uh, saw the sky clear out a little bit around sunset. So here's a look at the rain chances just for Thanksgiving. We have it at 60% from before sunrise all the way through noon. And then we drop down to 30% by 4 p.m and 20% at 6 p.m. So there you go. Most of the rain and the scattered showers is going to be the first part of the day. Otherwise warm and actually noticeably humid. So in the morning, Thanksgiving, wet roads reduce visibility. Afternoon, fewer showers, not as many, but warm and humid. And then in the evening, mainly dry with some partial clearing. By Friday, it looks like we'll start the day with some scattered areas of rain. 59 the high temperature, windy as well. Saturday, Sunday. Oh, looking, feeling good. Very uh, seasonable mornings in the low 40s, afternoons near 70 with that sunshine. So get ready for uh, wet drives on uh, Thanksgiving morning. All right. Be careful out there. Hello, Greg. Hello, Miss Stephanie. So Dak has been busy out there recruiting. Well, you would think with their offensive explosion they just had in the last game, there this talk about Odell Beckham Jr. would die down. That hasn't been the case. In fact, he's making his pitch to OBJ when we come back. More about that. And the Spurs with the big assist right before Thanksgiving tonight. Coming up. We're making such an impact on the community and, you know, families um, in need. And it just means so much to us. The Spurs help the food bank with a season of giving for Thanksgiving in big board sports. But first. Pro football coverage. Powered by Davis Law Firm. Micah Parsons limited in practice today as the Dallas Cowboys deal with a short week to get ready for the New York Giants on Thanksgiving Day. That's after they did not practice on Monday. He did not practice on Monday after picking up a knee and ankle injury in the 40 to 30 mauling to Minnesota, where he was a one-man wrecking crew and part of that seven-sack performance to give him 10 total for the season. Now, Cowboys offense looked its best during the route of the Vikings, but that hasn't lessened the talk about trying to sign free agent wide receiver Odell Beckham Jr. Quarterback Dak Prescott made his pitch today. He knows how much um, I've, I've won him here, uh, and a lot of these guys in this locker room I've seen have reached out on their own in, in different ways to make sure that, uh, yeah, he understands that this is a team that he can help, and we want him to come out. 
All right, the Houston Texans may be finally admitting they made a mistake by not drafting the quarterback in 2022. That's because, according to reports, the Texans are considering making a change at quarterback, replacing second-year starter Davis Mills with a more experienced Kyle Allen, especially after Mills and the Texans' terrible performance in the 23-10 loss to the Commanders, in which Mills threw a pick six in his second pass attempt, and the offense as a whole only managed five yards in the first half, prompting the home crowd to boo the team off the field. While head coach Lovey Smith didn't confirm the change, he certainly pointed us in that direction. Have I watched the video a few different times? Yeah, and made some decisions on how we're going to go forward. Um, but you can probably understand if, like all changes and anything that we do from week to week, you kind of talk to the players first before we talk to you. So um, we're not pleased with where we are. And uh, do we need to do some things differently? Yes, and we will. Go. Now that the Houston, or I should say UTSA Roadrunners have the regular season title locked up in Conference USA, they have a chance to go undefeated in league play for the first time when they host UTEP in the Alamo Dome on Saturday. It's also Senior Day when 21 seniors will be honored prior to kickoff in their last regular season home game for the Roadrunners. That would include quarterback Frank Harris, Brendan Brady, and Zachary Franklin to name a few. I am a senior. I've been a senior for the past two seasons. So, I mean, just going all out there. You know, if I don't decide to come back, um, at least I was able to do it, you know, be a part of senior night. And uh, I came in with a lot of these guys, so um, just being a part of it is going to mean a lot for me. With this week being Thanksgiving and all that, you know, Coach Trailer's model this week is, uh, you know, attitude of gratitude. And so, um, you know, we're just really grateful where we're at right now and, you know, the family that we have um, on this team. Um, it's like a brotherhood, really. Um, and so, you know, we're just, we got a lot left to play for. Um, so, you know, we're practicing for that. All right, kickoff for UTSA on Saturday. The Alba Dome is set for 2.30. The University of the Incarnate Word found out today that their star quarterback, Lindsey Scott Jr., is a finalist for the 2022 Walter Payton Award, which is presented to the National Offensive Player of the Year in the FCS. It's just one season. Scott has smashed season records for UIW by being number one in the nation in touchdowns of 50, only one interception, and second in the nation in passing yards with 3,791. He also has a 73% completion rate. And how about another seven scored on the ground, 57 in all, which is a new school record and now his team is ranked seventh in the nation the fps postseason Brennan Bears finished their season last year at 13-1 after they were ousted in the Class 6A Regional Finals by the Lake Travis Cavaliers. Well, guess who they have to face in the Class 6A Regional Semifinals this year? You got it, the Cavaliers again, coming out their last second 24-21 victory over the Steel Knights, ending their season last Friday night. It was the Cavaliers who outscored Brennan last year, 42-17, but this year the Bears are coming off a dominating 42-7 win on the road against Los Fresnos, leading up to the revenge game this Friday night. I remember all that last year, you know, like, like Travis is a really good coach team. They have really good players and um, we're just going to treat them how we treat everybody about this season. I mean, it's really important for us to win because we know we can, you know, all season trying to get back to this, uh, the same position, going back, going back to the fourth round and Lake Travis is in our way. So, you know, we have to beat them. All right. The playoff rematch between Brennan and Lake Travis to take place at the Brothels Canyon Friday night at six o'clock. The Spurs with the big assist during the holidays coming up. Following practice today, our San Antonio Spurs, in conjunction with H-E-B and the Food Bank, gave the big assist in the season of giving to help families during the Thanksgiving holidays. The Spurs, Doug McDermott, Kata bates Dia, Romeo Langford, Isaiah Roby, and, of course, a coyote, all helping out hand out 200 turkey dinners to needy families. I've been on quite a few teams in a lot of cities, and this is uh, the closest relationship I've had with like an organization like the San Antonio Food Bank and uh, what they do with the Spurs and be able to uh, do stuff like this is just huge. It goes, it goes a long way. All right, for me personally, it was worth the trip making it out there today just to see Chris Davis, a member of the Spurs Media Relations Department, dress up as a turkey. <laughs> awesome, Chris. Yeah. Good job. Yeah, he's, he's loving it right now that you're putting him on TV, too. I'm sure he is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's why he did it. Yeah. <laughs> right. He looked warm. Yeah. He did. It's fine. He did. <laughs> we'll be right back after this. That's it for the night beat. GMSA starts at 430. All right. Have a wonderful night. And I know you'll be spending tomorrow just trying to prepare that turkey, getting all that stuff going. We'll be here for you. We'll see you.